Hello the world, hello the internet, hello Jason Isaacs, I'm back, I'm back in my old office, it's good to be back here, scene of uh, many lockdown videos, um, but it's been a while since I did anything like that, a while since I cranked out a video, and between that and the fact that I've been engaged in a few, um, few interesting exchanges with some of the more excitable areas of the internet, I thought I'd uh, go with something fairly non-controversial to uh, get myself back into the game fairly gently, so... Um, Let's crack on with Shemima Begum and Judicial Review right after the introduction. See you in a minute. So, Shemaim and Begum and Judicial Review. This is actually a, a presentation I did a couple of years ago, but I thought it'd be a good idea to dust it off and revisit it, given that the BBC documentary on Shemaim and Begum has, uh, has just come out. Uh, if you haven't seen that, um, I strongly advise that you do uh, go and watch it. It uh, raises lots of very interesting questions. Questions, actually, that I'm probably not going to visit uh, in this particular uh, presentation um, and not just because there are those corners of the internet that I'd rather not uh, uh, excite. What we want to focus on here instead is what the Shemima Begum case tells us about judicial review and every time we come back and we look at this case then uh, that has to be the the core idea. Now this is Lady Justice uh, Elizabeth Lang talking about the case. She was the chair of SIAC uh, at the time. She has since gone on to uh, even bigger and better things. And uh, it's worth just spending some time here thinking about what that means. Judicial review is the process whereby we, or rather the courts, review the application of Parliament's law. This is not about justice. This is not about rights and wrongs. It's about the will of Parliament. Has the will of Parliament been upheld? And throughout all of this particular case, that's what's really at stake here. At one point, at one point, we slide from the application of parliamentary will into the rights and wrongs of the case. And that does make things very confusing for everybody concerned. We'll see if we can skirt over that. However, this is the second time I've tried to record this presentation. I confused myself terribly the first time. We'll try to make sure that we keep this as clear as we possibly can. So... Bearing in mind that what we're looking at here is judicial review, uh, let's get on with the show. Now, before we start, worth having a look at the structure of the courts uh, in, the, uh, in England. So what we're interested in is SIAC. That is the Special uh, Immigration Appeals Commission. For the purposes of our game, SIAC operates at this sort of level here with the, uh, with the uh, employment tribunals uh, are. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's certainly analogous and close enough uh, for our purposes. And the Special Immigration Appeals Commission is the body that first heard uh, her appeal and worked with the Home Secretary to arrive at its particular decision. So again, all the way through this, what we're looking at are not the rights and wrongs of any particular application or any particular decision but rather whether or not the law has, has been upheld. Specifically, in the exercise of their legally described powers, have our democratically, democratically elected officials overstepped the powers uh, that Parliament gave them? That is to act ultra vires, uh, a word that's probably familiar uh, to a lot of you. Have they failed to follow fair and due process or have they acted in a way that is irrational? So that's what the courts are there to evaluate, not whether a particular decision is right or wrong, but rather, how was that decision made? Does that decision exceed uh, a parliament, a, a minister's uh, legally described uh, powers? Okay, good. Hopefully that's clear. Um, let's move on to what actually happened. But before we get on to that, perhaps a little bit of background uh, would be useful. Okay, I don't plan on going into this in too much detail, not least because this video is going to be long enough already, and a lot of the 
specifics of the case are not really material to what we're interested uh, in. Um, also, if you are interested in the background, that's described beautifully. Uh, well, beautifully is perhaps the wrong word, but very thoroughly uh, by the BBC documentary, so go and watch that. What we need to know is that Shemima Begum is British. She was born in um, 1999 in the UK to parents uh, of Bangladeshi extraction, but who had arrived and settled uh, entirely legally uh, within the UK. So, Shemima Begum, born and raised in the UK, and then at the age of 15, uh, sorry, at the age of 15, 16, uh, she decides to uh, join the Islamic State. Uh, in the Levant. Um, there she very, very quickly marries a, uh, a fighter who was actually of Dutch extraction. Um, but um, with him, she has two children uh, who, um, you know, very sadly and, uh, and later die. And be because of the way in which everything was going south, again, not something I really want to go into in too much detail here. Uh, she leaves ISIL and uh, arrives as a refugee camp in northern Syria. Um, I can't remember which stage the children die, but she's pregnant again, and um, expresses uh, a decision to journalists from the Times that she meets that she would like to return to the UK. Um, but then she also says some things that uh, didn't play particularly well and uh, yeah, some pretty terrible things uh, about, uh, particularly with relation to the Manchester bombings that had recently happened. Um, and as a direct consequence of that, the next day, the Home Secretary stripped uh, Shimama Begum of her citizenship. Now, this happens under the British Nationalities Act, and this law, the will of Parliament, says if the Home Secretary has good reason to do so, uh, then, the, uh, then he can revoke a person's citizenship on the condition that that does not leave that person stateless. Now, uh, you'll see Sajid Javed uh, on the video explaining, you know, if you knew the things that I knew, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Now, we can argue the rights and wrongs of that particular position, uh, but that's not pertinent to the case as it stands. The case as it stands is, did the Home Secretary act within his legally described powers? And the legally described powers, the British Nationality Act, gives discretion to the Home Secretary to revoke somebody's citizenship if uh, they pose a threat to national security and if they believe that there are good reasons to do so, if that person is not left stateless. Now remember, effectively, this left her de facto stateless. Um, and that would seem to be unlawful. However, because she was of Bangladeshi parentage or extraction, um, the argument was, well, Bangladesh could give her citizenship. At which point Bangladesh said, well, we're not going to give her citizenship. Ah, yes, said the uh, said Sayak, and indeed said the Home Secretary, you might do. And if you don't, then maybe the Netherlands will, because, you know, she was married to a Dutch person, and that might give her leave to uh, enter the uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> the the Dutch people, the, the Netherlands, were going, we're not going to give her leave to enter either. We're not going to give her citizenship. So, effectively, de facto, um, Shemaim Begum was left stateless, in the refugee camp. However, because she might at some point get Bangladeshi or Dutch or indeed some other citizenship, as far as the Home Secretary was concerned, he was acting within his powers. Now we'll come back and look at that again uh, in, a, in a little while, but that's the key point of that particular, of that particular uh, moment in, in our timeline. This is almost immediately appealed by Shemima Begum, um, and um, she says, well, you're leaving me stateless, and more to the point, I cannot argue my case from a refugee camp in Syria. I need to be allowed to enter the UK so I can argue my case and defend uh, my position. The Home Secretary said, no, you cannot do that. Uh, because you pose a threat to national security. Again, this was a le this was a legal well, sorry, this was based on powers given to him by Parliament, given to the Home Secretary by par by Parliament. Um, and it's probably time that we have a look at those particular uh, powers as described by those particular laws. <sighs> Hope everything's clear so far. This is complicated, so um, yeah, try to stay with me.
Okay, we've been talking a lot about the will of Parliament. Let's see how Parliament has expressed its will in this particular instance. Now, this is a whole tangle of legislation um, involving nationality, citizenship, asylum, refugee status, and so on and so forth. Um, but the two ones that seem to come out more than any other, the pertinent bits that seem to come out uh, more than any other, are first of all the British Nationality Act of 1981, which says that the Home Secretary has the right to deny someone their citizenship or to revoke uh, their citizenship if that serves the public interest and uh, that does not leave the person stateless. So that's the first uh, law that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the second one is the, well, again, there's a whole tangle of legislation, but let's focus in on this one. This is the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act, and specifically Section 97.3 of that act that says, and this is a quote, um, the Secretary of State certifies that the decision is or was taken wholly or partly in reliance on information which, in his opinion, should not be made public because of national security grounds. So that's the legislation uh, that we're looking at. British Nationality Act, National Immigration, and, and a whole tangle of other legislation besides, but those seem to be uh, the two key ones. So let's look at that legal framework now in terms of the decisions that were made. So the first is that the Home Secretary uh, strips Shamima Begum or revokes Shamima Begum's uh, citizenship, um, and that was based on the public good under the terms of the British Nationality Act. So that's the first bit. The uh, next bit is that he denied Shimaima Begum the right to come and contest that decision in the UK again on the public good, but it's specifically on national security grounds as described by the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act of 2002. Now, the first port of call uh, there was SIAC and SIAC upheld uh, those particular decisions um, and then that went to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal made two critical decisions themselves. The first that um, they, they did not contest or rather they upheld uh, the Home Secretary's right to deny uh, Shamima Begum or to revoke her, her citizenship. Now that's a really important decision because again you're not supposed to be left stateless. Um, however the argument made by the Home Secretary, SIAC, and in this instance, the Court of Appeal, was that uh, while you know she might have been born in Britain, uh, she was of Bangladeshi extraction and therefore a Bangladeshi citizen. Now, at this point, it's worth pointing out that Bangladesh said, no, no, we're not interested in this at all. We're not having anything to do with her. But that kind of isn't the point. The point is that they could. Um, and because they could, she was de jure, not stateless. De facto, you know, arguably, yes, left in the... Syrian refugee camp without British citizenship and Bangladesh saying, well, we don't want anything to do with her. Um, then, um, you know, arguably there's a sort of de facto statelessness there, but not de jure because the uh, Bangladesh could give her citizenship. In fact, the Netherlands uh, could arguably have given her citizenship because remember she was married to a Dutch jihadist. Uh, of course, the Netherlands weren't going to have anything to do with it either. But the key thing is that this was a discretionary power and the Courts at this point are trying always to give the benefit of the doubt to the elected officials. You know, the idea being that we wanted these guys in charge and it's not for the courts to exercise discretionary power where that discretionary power has been given to our elected officials. If we don't like the way our elected officials are dispensing their discretionary power, then it's incumbent on us to vote them out and not to go through the courts. So the question here is not whether this is right or wrong, but were the powers exercised in a way that was consistent with the law? And in this case, the Supreme, the, the Court of Appeal said, yes, stripping her or revoking uh, Shwami Begum's citizenship was entirely lawful. However, they then argued that the decision to revoke leave to enter was not lawful. Now, I don't want to get into the ins and outs of that particular decision because, as I said, I've had several cracks at this presentation already and it's really confusing. The key thing to take away from this is that the Supreme, that the Court of Appeal said that decision was not lawful um, and therefore they upheld Shemima Begum's right to enter the UK to contest 
the SIAC and the Home Secretary's decision. They argued, as it says there, that the right to a fair trial takes precedent over national security. And um, there were referrals to the uh, European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, sorry, and uh, all sorts of other things. But um, don't want to get dragged into that. Key point then, two decisions. The first one upheld the Home Secretary's right to revoke uh, become citizenship. However, um, the the that Shabam Shabam Begum could uh, come into the UK to contest uh, her that decision, and therefore should. Essentially, that's oh what uh, your philosophers would call the naturalistic fallacy. But I don't want to get dragged into that either. Now, the reason why we can just skip to the good bit essentially is because the Supreme Court swings in, um, and uh, they made a critical point. Now, remember that the we're not at this point contesting the decision to revoke her citizenship. That's essentially done and dusted. That was lawful. That was within uh, parliamentary legislation. The Court of Appeal had argued that the Supreme, that the Home Secretary had not acted in a way that was lawful by denying her leave to enter, and they got a massive slap down uh, by the Supreme Court. They said, no, you are exercising discretionary power that is not yours to exercise. That's addressed to the Supreme, to the Court of Appeal. It's not for the Court of Appeal to decide whether or not it is safe for Shemima Begum to enter the UK. That decision uh, is given by law to the Home Secretary, and so the Home Secretary's decision uh, stands. And again, any sort of referral to the European Court Convention on Human Rights is uh, is is not relevant uh, because you know we revoked her citizenship, and she's no longer a European citizen. Um, and anyway, parliamentary legislation takes precedence over that anyway. Now, remember that the we, we talked about the way in which um, SIAC sits within this particular system. SIAC sits at a level that's analogous there to the Employment Tribunal. So an appeal, an appeal from there goes to the Court of Appeal and from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. And, you know, as we say there, the Court of Appeal... Um, looked at the decision to revoke citizenship and decided that was lawful, looked at the decision to refuse leave to enter and decided that was unlawful, uh, then that gets flipped up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court found a way to give the Home Secretary the benefit of the doubt because he is the elected official and you know we will find a way to accommodate their actions because the job of the courts is not to, in this instance, certainly an exercise of um, of um, of um, judicial review, not to dispense justice, but rather to decide whether or not people are acting in a way that is lawful. So again, that idea, this legislation gives discretionary power to the Home Secretary, as long as he is acting within those, within the restrictions or the limits of those discretionary powers. He is acting lawfully. He did not exceed his power. He did not act irrationally and he followed due process. And again, that slap down to the Court of Appeal, uh, exercising its own discretion, uh, which he was not entitled to do so because the courts are not there to exercise discretion in questions of judicial review. Um, kind of begs the question why the Court of Appeal did that. Um, and I read somewhere, I, I for the life of me can't remember where it was or or, uh, or I certainly can't find it again, that the, uh, the Court of Appeal knew that it was going to get slapped down. It knew that its decision was arguably not strictly right, but uh, it wanted to make a point uh, because it thought that the government had behaved in a way that was fairly shabby. Now, I, I can't corroborate that, uh, but it's a very interesting argument. And it would certainly explain why it was that the Supreme Court, that the Crown, the Court of Appeal, sorry, made um, such a peculiar uh, decision. So, whew. This is complicated, um, but hopefully we're at a point now where we can see the difference between essentially what is right and what is wrong and what is lawful. But we'll have a look at that again in the next slide. So when we're looking at cases of judicial review, this is not at any stage about whether or not a decision is ethically right. Remember that quotation. Uh, from Lady Justice at the start. We're not looking at the merits of the decision. The merits for the decision, it's a political decision, essentially. And it's not for the courts to hold politicians to account on ethical or merit grounds or political grounds. That's our job. 
the job of the courts is to do is to determine whether or not the politicians have acted within uh, the confines of their powers as described by Parliament. And so, uh, again, this is not about, certainly in terms of the decision made by the Supreme Court, it was not about the rights and wrongs. It was not about the ethics of Sajid Javid's uh, decision. That's for us to decide. What the courts are there to decide is whether or not the Home Secretary or indeed all politicians act lawfully. Do they act in a way that is within their legal powers? Do they act in a way that is uh, consistent with due process? Do they act in a way that is clearly uh, rational and uh, arguably fair? So that's what judicial review is about. That's what the courts are there to do. And I hope that that has made things a little clearer. Um, as to whether or not Shemaya Begum should be allowed uh, to come back into the country and argue the case for the restoration of her citizenship, that is an entirely separate and uh, different question that I look forward to hearing your views on. And indeed, if there's anything else uh, that you'd like me to cover, do let me know and uh, I'll do it the best I can. Um, and um, yeah, like and subscribe, tell your friends. And uh, if anyone's interested in some specific tuition, we can certainly talk about that. Just drop me a line uh, in the chat. Thank you all very much. Take care and look forward to uh, the next video, Oh, which is going to be on exam technique. So uh, watch out for that. Take care now. Bye.